so in today's talk, I will uh, I will try to I will mention our research project that uh, I have been doing for four years with Dana and Dennis, and the title of my talk is uh, Dense Electrode Array Current Optimization for Targeted and Directional TDCS, which stands for Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation. And I'll uh, try to describe uh, what this title means. But before going into that, I want to actually mention why we actually do this. And then i uh, say what we actually do. So depression is one of the... Uh, one of brain conditions that's very common and it affects people's daily lives and when it becomes major it actually may uh, uh, force uh, the subject the people to actually commit suicide so you can see some numbers here that uh, show how severe this condition is and this is only one of the brain conditions uh, where brain stimulation techniques might be useful. When we look at the treatments of depression, for example, the medication is costly and it actually, some of the subjects don't even respond to medication. And uh, psychotherapy might not be helpful in terms of, uh, depending on the majority of the mildness of the uh, symptoms. This is where brain stimulation techniques uh, can be useful and uh, I will uh, mainly talk about one of these techniques and in my uh, following slide I will mention what the difference between these techniques are. So, of course these are only three brain stimulation techniques, there are much more out there and uh, the main difference between this uh, uh, deep brain stimulation, magnetic stimulation, and uh, transcranial direct current stimulation is, well, first of all, it, their aim may change, and depending on that, the amount of current you apply to the brain uh, might vary. And uh, secondly, the technique, uh, the protocol, uh, of course, changes. Deep brain stimulation is invasive, so you, you might need surgery to actually implant electrodes to apply currents, uh, but the other two techniques are non-invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, when we compare the two, we, we see that uh, direct current stimulation is actually cheaper and it's more mobile, so you might actually just uh, move two electrodes and one battery around to uh, apply currents to people's head. So I will this I will talk about only here two studies that actually show the TDCS may may be very useful in terms of treating depression or helping uh, supporting treatments of depression. And uh, so in these uh, studies, uh, the subjects were uh, people who did not respond to medication, and with these subjects. Uh, when, we comp when the researchers compared TDCS to sham, uh, which uh, has the same protocol, you put electrodes on the skull but you don't uh, apply current. So it is to just uh, make sure the subjects are, uh, it's not a placebo effect, it actually changes the, the scores. And uh, the studies show that it's actually promising. This technique may be useful in terms of supporting depression treatments. And uh, this is, of course, just uh, an example. And there are a lot more studies that show that this technique may be useful in terms of supporting other brain conditions and also can be applied to healthy subjects to improve cognitive function. So, one of the barriers is, of course, since this technique is non-invasive, meaning the electrodes are on, on the scalp, there is not uh, 
enough control over the currents that go in inside the head. And uh, here, uh, this was our motivation in this research. We wanted to make sure we come up with methods that help us uh, control the currents such that we actually apply the intended currents to the regions that we want and we do not uh, have uh, adverse effects on the brain. So, instead of two electrodes, if we just increase the number of electrodes, we could cover more area on the spot and by changing, uh, manipulating these currents, uh, we are more flexible uh, in terms of changing the direction and the magnitude of current inside the head. So, we said, uh, let's uh, try to optimize stimulus patterns for this dense electrode arrays uh, to create more focal solutions compared to conventional to electrode uh, montages. And one important note I think I should mention here is that since we are uh, dealing with uh, human brain, the subject to subject vari variability is huge. This is uh, in the depression population or even the anatomical changes might be very important and we might need to consider that as well. So, having a complex human head uh, and also non-focal stimulation with conventional TDCS, our research plan was to uh, develop methods that actually overcome these barriers that I put on this slide. There are, of course, a lot more, but this is just, this is going to be the barriers that we address to the rest of my talk. So this was our systematic plan four years ago when we started, but I actually inked this and put it on the slide after I took uh, Michael's course. So our uh, main focus will be these three research trusts. We will uh, formulate an optimization problem to increase the focality and directionality of transcranial direct current stimulation. We will uh, make sure our method is uh, flexible enough to uh, incorporate subject-specific uh, safety constraints and uh, we will also try to make sure the solutions we come up are actually doable, are uh, cheap and uh, mobile. So this is the head model we have, and first thing we do is we define where we want the current to go. This is the region of interest. We would like to modulate this region, which we think is, relate, is related to the brain condition we have, or our uh, target. Uh, and uh, we also would like to have the currents to go in one particular direction. The reason for that is if you reverse the current direction in the brain region, you might actually have reverse effects. It's not very... The polarity in this case matters, matters a lot. And so we defined our objective function as maximize the directional current in the target brain structure. And this is shown here. So this is the current density along the desired direction field in the region of interest. And we would like to maximize this by changing the currents of the electrodes on the skull. Of course, we, we don't want current to be widely uh, spread in the brain, so we will apply safety constraints to make sure the, the solution is proper and also the pattern that we apply is uh, safe. So the current in the brain here is limited, the, the current power in the brain. This is one of our safety constraints. And uh, 
Although I show here it is just the brain outside our eye that we limit, we actually are capable of adding more uh, critical regions if we wanted to, and just limiting the, the regions uh, cover separately. So our uh, formulated optimization problem looks like this. We, uh, we maximize the current in the region of interest along a particular direction and uh, we limit the total current we apply each individual electrode current to prevent any uh, high uh, current intensities locally and also we make sure through the last uh, the, through the third uh, constraint that the solution is focal. Well, of course, we still don't know how to calculate current density in the head. So, this is where uh, we used uh, numerical methods to estimate current density. And I will briefly describe what that numerical method is. So, what we want is we would like to find potential field in the head, but all we know is what happens on the head boundary. We know where we apply how much current, and we also know what the relationship, what, what the, the driving uh, differential equation for potential field inside the head is. In this case, we assume there is no current sources in the brain, and so we can just describe the potential with Laplace equation, which we will solve numerically using finite element methods. And so finite element, you just discretize the domain and you assume simpler forms for your unknown fit in these uh, subdomains. Here, for example, we have three subdomains and instead of uh, trying to estimate this uh, complex field, you just assume in each of these uh, smaller subdomains the field is linear and you get uh, set of linear equations from which you can find the coefficients of these basis functions from which you can estimate the unknown field. So this is one of the examples, one of the head models used, the discretization example, and it contains three million uh, finite elements, but as you can see it's still coarse, it doesn't uh, really show the detail of uh, cortical surface and all folded structure of the brain. So we had another model developed by Moritz Den Hauer, one of our colleagues, and uh, he made sure uh, in this model uh, the anatomy is uh, as accurate as possible. And in addition, he also uh, made sure also the conductivities are estimated as accurately as possible. And so after domain discretization, our problem becomes uh, as the one on the right hand side. And what we can infer from this uh, set of e uh, equations is it is as much, uh, it's a very simple problem. The number of unknowns is just the uh, of size number of electrodes. And it is a convex problem. It has a linear objective with uh, one quadratic constraint and some box constraints. So it's very easy to solve. And we solve this problem using the general convex solvers that are implemented for MATLAB. So in our simulations, we chose four different ROIs. We chose the desired direction as normal to the cortical surface and we try to maximize the current in each of these arrows. These are the safety constraint bounds we used, and these are the results. <coughs> so, from the current density streamlines figures on the bottom, we see that the current, we see visually that the current is along the, the direction we wanted, and actually I checked the, how much the percentage of the current along the portable surface normal and it is about uh, 70 to 80 percent which is quite high considering the uh, portable surface normal 
it actually changes through the ROI and you might have conflicting desired directions depending on how folded the structure is. But we needed uh, to quantify that our solutions are focal and this is uh, these uh, plots show the histograms for the current in different uh, layers in the head for different uh, ROIs. And if you look at the two histograms on the left, we have medial frontal cortex and uh, parahippocampal gyrus, which is relatively deeper than the first one. And what we see is uh, the histogram for the ROI, which is red, and histogram for gray matter are uh, well separated in MFC case than in the PHCG case. And what this tells us, how the, the separateness between these histograms actually is a good indicator of how focal you are. You would like to maximize the current in the ROI without not having too much current in the rest of the brain, in gray matter in this case. So this actually shows us that it may be more difficult to target the regions. And the <coughs> following slides I will try to show the flexibility of the formulation. So here we actually added another constraint uh, that limited the current in the eye to prevent false fins. And what we can see is that in the second uh, optimization scenario the optimal pattern is uh, such that there is less current in the eye as, as we wanted. So we put add, uh, additional constraints depending on what the need of the subject is or uh, what uh, different scenarios might require. <coughs> and uh, so our optimization problem is very fast and uh, using that we could actually investigate what the effect of each safety constraint is on our uh, solution. Here I plotted the objective function contours with highest current in the brain as color map and uh, so the idea is to keep the objective function as high as possible but not having uh, very high peak currents in the brain. And the uh, saturation in this and uh, in uh, both directions shows that uh, increasing the safety constraint bounds might not actually help you improve in terms of objective function, but you might be actually increasing the highest current uh, value in the brain which uh, we chose as the safety criteria here. So this is a good uh, way of investigating what each safety constraint effect on the solution is and what uh, numbers uh, we might want to choose depending on that. Here there is, uh, we chose motor cortex array and this is actually a different uh, stimulation technique where the electrodes are put on the scalp with surgery and we showed that our optimization problem again may be useful in, in terms of uh, optimizing the currents applied to EPOG electrodes and uh, what we found out was that the solutions that we get with our method they don't match with uh, what uh, what's been applied in today's experiments, bipolar and quadru quadrupolar uh, stimulation uh, configurations that are used. And uh, of course, all these uh, results need need to be validated through experiments. But uh, seeing that uh, optimal patterns may be different than what's been used is a good preliminary result. So there are two other techniques in this field that actually uh, have a convex formulation and we said why not compare our method uh, to theirs and see if the solutions change considerably. And when we compare 
our solution to the Machowski, which uses uh, list weighted list squares to find the solution. We see that the solution uh, may uh, look uh, similar, but uh, what they assume is they actually assume they know what the desired uh, current field is. And uh, this is uh, a very this is very difficult to infer. We we just assume that we know the direction, but the magnitude is left as a free variable. In our case, they assume they know what they want in the in the brain and in the region of interest. In the other technique, they on they are only concerned about the current component that's normal to the cortical surface, and they also assume they know the value for the magnitude of the current <coughs> this component. And uh, so our solution, I think, is a good uh, alternative to what we, we, we have in the field right now. So the solutions we get, <coughs> as can be seen from uh, previous slides, they use uh, all the electrodes, although some of the electrodes might have very small currents, uh, they still use high density arrays and uh, using high density arrays may be costly. You might want to look at solutions where less number of electrodes or current sources are used. And actually uh, our collaborators at EGI asked us if we can come up with solutions where only a few <coughs> current sources are used. And we, we adopted branch and bound algorithm, which is used to solve MPR problems, to actually find solutions where only a few current sources are used. And the, the way the algorithm works is, we have all possible configurations you might have with, for example, let's just assume we have in this case uh, two current sources. All possible configurations are at root, and then we, these configurations, they either are in this branch or in that branch, depending on what the state of first electrode is. You might not, you cannot have any other uh, than having the first electrode either connected or not connected. So instead of solving the problem here, you could actually solve two uh, sub-problems in these branches and uh, the solution the, the, the best solution in this sub-branches sub will give you the optimal solution. And so we cluster all these configurations and we create this enumeration tree. And what this uh, helps us do is you can actually, depending on what the configuration up to that level is, you might actually find out the best possible solution you get from that branch may not exceed may not be better than what you already have in hand. So you discard all those configurations at once. So this is a way to actually just speed up what you have in brute force, where you just try all possible combinatorial cases one by one. And the speed up with this actually is on the <coughs> orders of five, six, so it's uh, uh, quite good. This is the orders of magnitude, so it's uh, 10 to the power 6 faster than brute force search. And these are the results we get. Here we use only two current sources, three and four current sources, and uh, we get different uh, solutions and as the algorithm proceeds. And uh, what we see uh, when we look at the optimal uh, current in the ROI, our objective function, we realize that the value doesn't drop too much when we use only a few current sources. So this suggests that we might actually survive with using only a few current sources and the cost may not be as high as we thought it would be. But then again that was a focal ROI and that may be why we used only a few current sources. So we said what we were wondering what might happen when you have a complex array that's distributed across 
and higher brain does it we would need more sources or not and uh, it, uh, the drop in objective function shows uh, we might actually need a few more current sources but still the uh, fourth percent drop being significantly important or not that's uh, a question to be answered via experiments To conclude, uh, I think there is still a lot to explore in this field. TDCS is a very young field and uh, there is still a lot to be known about brain as well, as you might guess. And so we will need uh, computational models to support all these experiments that are being done. And uh, in terms of understanding the mechanism of the technique, and uh, all these simulations we have done uh, are a, uh, is a good step towards actually now uh, uh, constructing experiments and validating our results which then can be used to actually build systems that actually go to hospitals and clinics and help people. And this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, can you tell me why you need so many um, connectors to solve this problem? Can, can you reduce this number in some ways to have regions that can be done? That was something confusing for me first. Do you mean, do we, how many, how why do we need that many? That electrodes? many, yes, yes. It why, is, I know, is it clear how many really do you have an optimal number for it? Or how do, how do you decide about that? that that's actually a very good question. As you use, so from the optimal patterns, we don't necessarily use all these electrodes. Mm -hmm. But it is still uh, useful to have coverage over the entire skull to have more flexibility, more degrees of freedom in terms of uh, what could be done. But uh, whether the solution that we get uses all these electrodes or not, that's uh, than a question of optimizing uh, the cost mm -hmm. and uh, using less electrodes. Yeah. And uh, I have a second question because I was involved in consulting for you know uh, just two electrodes, okay. one for neural, one for uh, spinal and neural, uh, neural and uh, peripherals. Yeah. And um, that was very successful for some of the patients that they had MS and so forth. Um, over the past year, I was involved with that. And I just wanted to know your opinion about um, if, if the application is some of those applications that are right now is very hot in uh, solving the problem for patients like that. Uh, why should we go with this, uh, you know, with a, so many number of uh, sensors rather than just using two electrodes uh, technique? What is your opinion about that? So, I mean, the conventional two electrode montages, they are not focal, for sure. sure. They just uh, modulate the entire brain, and depending on uh, what, uh, how these currents interact with ongoing brain activity, mm -hmm. you might actually, you might observe the outcome that you intended. You might actually get successful results. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of, uh, Affecting only a target region in the brain, I think having more electrodes might be yes. useful. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. and uh, in addition, you might actually use the additional electrodes you don't use for uh, applying current. You can actually use them for verification mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. You might actually measure uh, potential EEG with these electrodes and just create uh, yeah. Those yeah. systems. The doctor that I was involved with, basically, he was more knowledgeable about, you know, about the two electrodes, how to connect that one to the uh, um, spinal as well as to uh, peripheral. So he knew exactly in this combination of te te technology and the doctors that are uh, experienced. So that was very really successful in some of the patients well, that he did. But I must add, uh, so I don't know whether Sumitra is here or not, but actually what she showed was, depending on what you want, 
the standard configurations that are used mm -hmm. today are not optimal. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course. Of, I mean, the behavioral results may show that uh, it is useful and it's promising, but you still that there is a black box in there sure. where you don't necessarily know how these currents affect the brain. And uh, what is the current... Uh